in the name of God. The great world religions preach peace and mercy. History, especially the history of the Middle Ages, proves that religion and violence are not contradictions. A belief in God often means believing in fighting on behalf of God and in being rewarded in paradise. Islam means peace. Christ teaches us to love our enemy, but in their names, the world wages war. The unique and triumphal expansion of Islam has made it the religion of many peoples from Spain to Indonesia. But there is no Islamic empire, just as there is no Christian empire. Everywhere in the Middle Ages there are wars among princes and tribes. For half a century there have been crusades to the Holy Land. After Islam, Christianity too spreads to every corner of the world. The center of Islamic civilization is Baghdad, the most magnificent city on earth. Not a holy place like Mecca and Medina, but a worldly Arabian capital city, like this one, a metropolis. At the end of the 8th century, Baghdad had become the center of the world. No other city could compare with this splendid capital, the centers of learning, the academies, the hospitals, the baths. Everything was perfect. The real threat to the worldly empire of Allah does not come from Europe. For two centuries, the Crusaders only threaten the coastal areas. The Christians want Jerusalem. That is what they are fighting for, with little success. For the Islamic empires, the Crusaders are a problem only on their borders. It is not a clash of civilizations. The real threat to Islam comes from the steppes of Asia. Like a natural disaster, the Mongols fall upon their enemies, merciless, annihilating, unbeatable. They bring no superior culture with them, only brutality. In 1258, Baghdad falls into their hands. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. The Mongols were much more the Mongols were much worse than their predecessors in Baghdad. Basically, they possessed no culture and simply destroyed everything in their path. At first, there was some religious tolerance, but the second phase of the Mongol rule was dreadful. The Mongols, mounted nomads, their wealth, herds of cattle. Revenge is their prime mover. Over the ages, the Mongols have lived by perfecting their herding skills. Drive the cattle together, cut the ones you want out of the herd, slaughter them. This turns them into perfect soldiers. In 1260, at Ain Chalut, they are defeated by the Arabs for the first time in history. They are forced to withdraw. The myth is destroyed. The really interesting thing about the Mongols is that they come storming over the horizon and conquer the Islamic territories pretty quickly, meaning that there's no time to evaluate the threat. 
These Mongol rulers adapted relatively quickly to the local population, with the result that after only 40 years, the first Mongol empire on Islamic territory, the empire of the Ikhana, has already become Islamic. Even today, Ain Chalut is the subject of heroic sagas and legends. The end of Mongol rule. But the real triumph is still greater. In only two generations, the mounted warriors who almost conquered Islam have themselves become Muslims. The Book of Allah is mightier than the Mongols' perfect military machine. Up to this point, the history of Islam has been a chain of amazing success. The story begins in the Arabian desert, in Mecca, with an orphan boy. In the year 569, in what is now Saudi Arabia, Muhammad is born. After losing both parents, he grows up with his uncle and becomes a merchant and caravan leader. Then, signs. A Christian monk foretells that Muhammad will become a prophet, and more than that, he will be the last, the ultimate prophet. He marries a 40-year-old woman, unusual for the time. It's a good marriage. His tribe, the Koraj, worship holy trees, stones, and many gods. When Muhammad is already over 40, the angel Gabriel appears to him for the first time. Muhammad, who is illiterate, receives a revelation from the angel in the form of the Quran. According to Islamic belief, the words of the Quran have always existed before the beginning of time with God. The Quran is holy and unchangeable. Through it, Arabic, the language of a few desert tribes, will spread like the wind. The words of the Quran are so masterful, so forceful, that to this day they represent Arabic poetry in its most perfect form. Man hat sogar schon einmal, um, it has even been said that the position of the Quran in Islam can really only be compared to the position of Jesus Christ in Christianity. Insofar as in Christianity, God became man, became flesh, incarnation, whereas in Islam, God became a book. So we can speak of an inlibration. To Muhammad are revealed the five pillars of Islam. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Every day, five prayers, alms for the poor, fasting during Ramadan, and the pilgrimage to Mecca. Muhammad is the last prophet, a perfect man, but still only a man. There are 28 prophets in the Quran, among them Adam and Abraham. For Muslims, Jesus is one of the prophets. Like Maria, he has a rather special place in the Quran, is known as the word and breath of Allah, and after his death is lifted up to God. Muslims do not believe in his crucifixion, saying that another was crucified in place of the prophet Jesus. The closely related Christian and Jewish religions were allowed to be practiced in Islamic empires. Christianity was similarly tolerant only in the later Crusader states. There was certainly an indirect awareness of certain common elements. For instance, from the early Middle Ages onwards, there are texts which repeatedly point out that, of course, Muslims too go all the way back to a common progenitor. Abraham. But that was not always seen as a positive argument or as representing a positive attitude towards Muslims. Perhaps it wouldn't be going too far to say that the Muslim religion was too similar to Christianity. And out of this similarity developed a degree of rivalry. If you want a comparison, Consider that within Christianity, the non-conformists, the heretics, are often viewed as worse enemies than the proponents of a totally different religious community. Einer ganz anderen Glaubensgemeinschaft. 
After an initial period of rejection, Islam spreads throughout Arabia with increasing rapidity. In the year 632, Muhammad dies. He has no son. A quarrel breaks out about his successor, the Caliph. Shortly afterwards, Muslims split up into Sunnis, who believe that any devout Muslim can become their religious leader, and Shiites, who only recognize the leadership of direct descendants of Muhammad's family. The new faith, and with it Arabic, the language of the Quran, spreads over the next 300 years with immense speed to the distant borders of the known world, where, for the most part, it still dominates today. Islam is not a pacifist religion. Muhammad was a prophet, a successful merchant and a military leader. Muslims may answer violence with violence. Their young, unspent religion makes them into good warriors. But Islam is not a religion of holy war. Right from the start, even in battles, there are moderating rules of conduct. For example, concerning the treatment of women and children. The term holy war is adopted by Muslims in the Middle Ages from Christians. Jihad means more than fighting the infidels. Jihad is a an Jihad is a noun from the verb jada, which means simply to make an effort. This is firstly an inner effort, an injunction to come to terms with oneself, together with a platonic world view that one must strive for self-improvement for the sake of one's religion. It's inner, but also outer-directed and therefore means to fight, the fight being directed purely outwards. Of course, that's very early. Both meanings become current very early on, though the Shiites, who are very important here, particularly emphasize the inner struggle, describing it as the first, the highest jihad. In other words, a Muslim must improve himself. In the early Middle Ages, the different Arab tribes and clans are bitter enemies. They buy slaves, mostly children of the non-Muslim Turkic peoples, and train them as elite Islamic warriors. This military enslavement becomes typical for Islam. These slave soldiers reach the highest ranks, and finally, many of them actually come to rule over the dynasties. It is often stated that the reason for this law is the Quran, which forbids Muslims from fighting against Muslims. But this commandment is broken from the very beginning. The military slaves are introduced for the first time in the Abbasid Empire, then later in the Mameluk dynasty, which was in fact maintained by these military slaves, as was the Sultanate of Delhi. This system of slavery is perhaps a reaction to the fact that in the early days of Islam, when rulers depended on mounted nomads who were organized tribally, they, the rulers, had problems with conflicting tribal loyalties. Whereas if they depended on slaves, whom they had raised themselves and given them a career, then they could count on absolute loyalty. The most famous ruler of a military slave dynasty is the legendary Saladin. Saladin is a Kurd and rules in Egypt from 1171. His Turkish Mamluk guards, Mamluk means slave, will later defeat the Mongols at Ain Chalut. The system of military slaves continues even after the Middle Ages. The Turkish Yanissary guards were recruited from 20,000 Russian and African children purchased every year. Christians had to surrender every fifth child to the Ottoman Empire. 800 AD, the victorious military expansion of Islam brings with it not only war and the new faith, but also 
superior scientific knowledge and an advanced culture. The Arabs have become a seafaring nation. They make new discoveries in the fields of mathematics, astronomy, cartography and navigation, optics, chemistry, physics and medicine. Muslim Arabs now produce the best scientists of the Middle Ages. The instruction in the Quran to pray in the direction of Mecca at certain hours demands a precise knowledge of time and orientation. Sailors navigating towards a fixed destination are more interested in practical theories than in theological correctness. The Arabs learn from every culture they encounter. Their scholars discover the works of the Greek philosophers. The result is a unique flowering of knowledge, culture and intellectual freedom. Arabic poetry, viewed with mistrust by the Quran, is a further driving force in this development. From this time, we have inherited such words as cipher, zero, algorithm, zenith, and our numbers. Surprisingly, the Arabic word for this process is linked to the concept of jihad. Ijtihad simply means to cultivate, to make fruitful everything one touches. In religion, in all disciplines, when one thinks of the great theologies, that means one must seek to innovate, not just to receive knowledge. This is shown in science and philosophy. They didn't merely take from the philosophy of the ancient Greeks, Plato and, above all, Aristotle, they contributed to the sum of knowledge. They innovated and communicated. Avicenna, along with Averroes, the most important philosopher-scientist, writes medical textbooks which continue to be studied in Europe well into the 17th century because there is nothing comparable in existence. The decline of this cultural and scientific flowering goes hand in hand with the growing power of orthodox theology. Aristotle's logic, one of the keys to scientific knowledge, is forbidden by the clergy. Philosophers become objects of contempt. The designs of Arab ships are copied by the Spaniards and Portuguese. Islamic knowledge is adopted. Around 1450, Europeans venture out into the Atlantic using Arab technology. Islamic and Arabic culture, a mighty structure on the foundations of a holy scripture, the Quran, creates masterpieces of architecture, technology and art because it understands how to turn Mediterranean culture to its own advantage. The most important centers of ancient science were not in Greece itself at all. They were in Alexandria, that is, in Egypt, and partly in Syria. These were places where one could draw on traditions that were still cultivated in the land that created them. In Europe, it was a little different. Germany or France were certainly not centers of learning in antiquity. Ja, auch in der Antike nicht Bildungszentren gewesen. Islam has overcome the barriers of clan and race. The Quran is a holy book from West Africa to Indonesia, a mighty culture. Its decline begins with the loss of intellectual freedom in the Middle Ages, with theological fossilization. Europe has much to thank Islam for. Spain flourished under the Omeyyad dynasty from 755 to 1031, and until the fall of the last Islamic enclave, Granada, in 1492. Even so, shortly after the occupation, the Reconquista begins, 
the attempt at reconquest by Christian forces. The struggle will last for centuries. Islam in Europe. For centuries, Muslim culture is a dynamic presence in Portugal and Spain. There are many unknown influences and features held in common. The Arabs bring chess to Europe, knowledge about gardens and agriculture. Their architecture contributes to the Gothic style, and Sufi mystics will later even influence the rules of the Jesuits. During the Umayyad period under Islam, Jews, Christians and Muslims lived together in peace. Christians are permitted to practice their faith. Islam respects both the Christian and Jewish religions, and in the Far East extends the same tolerance to Buddhism and Hinduism. Arts and crafts profit from Arabian knowledge. Damascus steel is just one example of Arabian skill in the working of metals. One of the most remarkable cultural sharings is knighthood, the ideal of chivalry held by Muslims and Christians of the early Middle Ages is very similar. Even the notion of romantic devotion to a distant, unreachable lady is probably an invention of early Arabic poetry. The culture of the troubadour from the poetry to the music has its origins in Baghdad and migrates to France. There was a common basis. A good example is the Syrian Usama ibn Munkit, who was himself a knight, and used this fact as a basis of understanding in his meetings with the Franks. He had a lot of respect for the Franks, because they were brave, and because they also represented this ideal of manhood. They met, and in this context felt very close to each other. He tells of many knights to whom he felt really close, like brothers. He calls them my brothers, my friends. Nevertheless, for centuries the struggle is for domination, for the final victory over the enemy. Muslim culture is fought and defeated, only then is it given due appreciation. Man kann sagen, dass nach Baghdad sicherlich Cordoba after Baghdad, Cordoba was certainly one of the most splendid cities of the time. For example, in the 10th century, a visitor from the Christian north, a monk from Lorraine, travelled to Cordoba. He was probably an envoy of King Otto I, and he's impressed by the city's splendour, its size, and also, it must be said, by the power of the Caliph in Cordoba. However, the processes of cultural exchange are not so marked in the 10th century during the time of the caliphs. It's not until after the Spanish Reconquista, the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula, which is mostly concluded by the middle of the 13th century, that we find a major process of cultural and literary exchange in Toledo or in Zaragoza. But in other cities too, works of antiquity, which had previously been translated in Syria, are now translated back into Latin with the help of Jewish translators. And so the whole of Aristotle finds its way into the universities, which at the start of the 13th century are just beginning to flourish in the Latin West. In Spain, the Muslim inheritance intermingles with the Christian culture. Europe can thank Islam for the return to its ancient roots. But there is another inheritance, a terrible one. Terrorism is invented in the 12th century by a fanatical Islamic splinter group called the Assassins. Their leader is the legendary Old Man of the Mountains, Hassan ibn Sabah. The headquarters of the Assassins lies in the inaccessible Iranian mountains, 
Iban Saba is the commander of this radical Shiite group. The assassins have sworn an oath of loyalty unto death to their Imam and are held responsible for several hundred murderous attacks. Among them, murders paid for by Christian crusaders. One shouldn't forget that the sect of the assassins claims legitimacy from the eldest son of a caliph from the end of the 12th century. Nizar, the Nizarids, they fought in support of this caliph, who claimed total power, including religious power. And before him, there were several Fatimid caliphs, who declared themselves to be Godheads incarnate. They were literally worshipped. A personality cult for suicide killers with its headquarters in the fortress of Alamut. Marco Polo relates how the assassins used a trick to recruit young men for their sect. The youths were given wine to drink which had been spiked with hashish. Soon they were in a state of intoxicated rapture. Then they were taken to the assassin's garden at the fortress of Alamut, where they were briefly allowed to enjoy all the temptations of the Muslim paradise. More was promised them as soon as they had carried out a murder for the sect. Terror funktioniert ja eigentlich so, dass man durch Abschreckung den Gegner dazu bringen möchte. Terrorism can be defined as intimidating one's opponent until he does or doesn't do certain things. Accounts we have about Rashid Adin Sinan, for example, how he dealt with Saladin, a contemporary who was very powerful, indicate that Rashid Adin Sinan used a series of carefully calculated actions of this kind to dissuade Saladin from conquering the Ishmaelite territories. It is told that Saladin awoke one morning to find a dagger and a message beside his bed. A warning not to go to war against the Nizarids. The terror raged for 200 years. It was finally the Mongols in 1256 who destroyed the fortress of Alamut and killed all the assassins. War and terror in the name of Allah are not the inventions of our present age. Then, as now, terror in the name of Allah is an abuse of Islam. War in the name of God. The great world religions preach peace and mercy. History, especially the history of the Middle Ages, proves that religion and violence are not contradictions. A belief in God often means believing in fighting on behalf of God and in being rewarded in paradise. Islam means peace. Christ teaches us to love our enemy. But in their names, the world wages war. Christianity, around the year 1100, is marked by a deep sense of piety, and by the desire of both laity and clergy to lead a holy life, and by the holy war against the heathen, the Crusades. 200 years, seven Crusades of murder and conquest in the name of the Prince of Peace. The Church creates an unholy mixture of faith and military service, a problematic legacy that pursues our civilization to this day, the Holy War.
It begins in the Old Testament with the Ark of the Covenant. The chest for the tablets with the Ten Commandments has magic powers. It makes the people of Israel invincible in war, a treasure that the Crusaders are hunting for too. During the Crusades, military religious orders are founded, the Knights Templar, the Knights of St. John, and the Teutonic Order. The combination of monk and soldier is one of the most bizarre inventions of the Middle Ages. Religious orders at war against the heathen. But what did this mixture of religion and violence, inexplicable to us today, mean to people in the Middle Ages? Man hat ja immer wieder im Zusammenhang mit den Kreuzzügen die Gewalt im Namen des Christentums. Talking about the Crusades, the tendency is to see the violence in the name of Christianity as a particularly serious crime. However, one should remember that the Middle Ages, and particularly the High Middle Ages, were an age of violence. So if you see the Crusades in this context, then there were perhaps just an extreme expression of what was a mundane and daily feature of medieval life. And yet, even in the Middle Ages, there are some of the faithful who are appalled by the association of war with the abused Son of God who preached love and peace. The East Roman Christians in Byzantium, whose monks strive for the ideal of seclusion from the world, find the holy knights more than suspect. But Byzantium is indirectly responsible for the Crusades. The cause is cries for help from Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. The Islamic empires have become a deadly threat to Byzantium. Muslim warriors are attacking the pilgrims. The news reaching the Christians gets worse and worse. The Byzantine patriarch, Alexios I, asks Pope Urban for help. Urban sees the possibility of using a campaign to remove the schism to reunite the Eastern Church and the Western Church. Muslims are desecrating the holy places, it is said. Pilgrims are being murdered. Rumors spread like wildfire. In the year 1095 at the Council of Clermont, Pope Urban II makes a speech that will go down in history. We know that in this We know that in this appeal, Many of the things that people felt moved by were probably addressed. The rewards of heaven are promised. There is the encouragement to act with knightly virtue, the call to liberate the holy places in Jerusalem again and to make them accessible to pilgrims. All this is combined in these four reports, and recently there has been speculation as to how the Pope invested his words with a full range of symbolic capital. He sighed, he wept, he obviously gave a rhetorically brilliant performance, which is why the reports say that the whole mass of people cried out, Deus le vult, God wills it. Deus le vult, God will it. In 1096, under the command of the monk Peter the Hermit, 30,000 enthusiastic believers set out on the pauper's crusade, 30,000 in need of food and drink. Their journey is marked by pillage and plunder. Only 3,000 return after their expedition is annihilated by the Islamic Seljuks. The same year sees the beginning of the First Crusade, Many kings take part. The Christians are under pressure to extend their empires. For the Kreuzzüge, Many structural changes in the High Middle Ages were responsible for the Crusades, but at the same time, they were also involved in a major process of expansion on the part of Latin Christianity. This expansion had progressed further since the early time of the conversion of the Teutons, particularly in the north, in 1066, I'm thinking of England and Denmark, it had come to a standstill. Poland, Hungary and Bohemia had been integrated into Latin Christianity around the year 1000 and then during the 11th century. In the south and southwest, 
The Muslims in South Italy and the Iberian Peninsula were pushed back so that Latin Christianity expanded there too. Zurückgedrängt, so dass auch dort die lateinische Christenheit expandierte. The First Crusade is a European enterprise. From France, Normandy, Flanders and Lorraine, a stream of knights make their way to Palestine to free the Holy Lands. It will take three years and many battles until they stand before Jerusalem. They lay siege to the Holy City for five weeks. Then the attack begins. Victory is followed by a massacre of 65,000 Jews and Muslims, women and children, that one can only describe as a frenzy of bloodlust, a terrible victory. The Holy Land belongs to the Christians for the time being. Europe around the year 1100 is undergoing profound changes. It is not just contact with foreign cultures. The population, just like the economy, is growing at a great pace. Trade becomes more important. Overpopulation becomes a problem. Who rules over all these people? Monarchs and the church are locked in power struggles. Everywhere there is change and expansion. The Crusades are part of this. The Crusades are not a clash of civilizations between Christianity and Islam. Christianity is divided, Rome and Byzantium. In the early Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire, the first Christian empire, was 20 times wealthier than Rome, but weakened by constant wars, exhausted by a vast administrative apparatus, its power is now slowly draining away. Byzantium, with its capital Constantinople, has called on the Crusaders for assistance, but it mistrusts them, justifiably, as will soon be seen. Hitherto, the Byzantine Church has dominated Christian theology, but that too will change. The Crusaders hire ships to take them to the Holy Land, an excellent business that makes many Italian cities rich. The Crusaders are becoming the economic factor of the Mediterranean region. Taking part in the Crusade represented the value of six years' labor. There has to be a powerful motive to endure the hardships and the risk of death. The Church has promised the Crusaders he who falls in battle against the heathen will be a martyr. In the Middle Ages, the fear of hell is great. The hope of reaching the kingdom of heaven, small. Almost everyone believes they are threatened by eternal damnation. The question is why the opportunity to become a martyr was so important to people in the Middle Ages. Not everyone wanted it, perhaps, but the chance of becoming one was extremely important. You only have to think of chapter 20 of the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelations, where it is prophesied that martyrs will immediately enjoy eternal life at the heavenly altar while others will have to wait their allotted time before they even have a chance of tasting the joys of heaven. The greatest propagandist of the Crusades is Bernard de Clairvaux. On the one hand, a devout mystic. On the other hand, he even promises thieves and murderers eternal life if they join the Crusade and kill heathens. His greatest hour comes in the year 1144. The Emir of Mosul conquers Edessa, a Christian principality since the First Crusade. In sermons of fire and brimstone, Bernard calls for the Second Crusade with resounding success. But it ends in military disaster.
Then, in 1187, catastrophe, the Battle of Hattin. A whole Crusader army is annihilated. The legendary Saladin defeats the Christians. Jerusalem falls. Doubting voices are heard. Is Bernard a false prophet? Why does God want this humiliating defeat? But enthusiasm for the Crusades does not weaken. Many later actions only add up to an inglorious chapter in the history of the West. Now, the so-called Fourth Crusade is particularly interesting because it heads not for the Holy Land, but for Constantinople, into the Byzantine Empire from 1202 to 1204. Venice had provided a fleet in Byzantium to transport the Crusaders and intended to secure financial support there for the Crusade. Once in Byzantium, however, the whole enterprise gets bogged down. Next, Constantinople is stormed and taken. A bloody massacre ensues, and the result is a Latin empire that lasts for about 60 years. The Crusaders remain for about a century in their territories along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. War in the name of God. And the defeats? Punishment, say the preachers, for the many sins of the Crusaders. Sins such as gambling, theft, and lust. And remarkably, there must also be penitence for the killing, although it is a holy war. Jerusalem has been lost but the Crusaders still have their castles and territories. For the nobility, was the prospect of new kingdoms not the most tempting feature of the Crusades? The many power struggles among the Muslims helped the Crusaders to secure the borders of their principalities. Numerous castles served this purpose. The orders of knights, however, are reluctant to acknowledge a superior command. They wish to act independently, as if these new rulers didn't exist. Indeed, there isn't a great deal of unity anyway among the Christian empires. The Normans of Antioch are in conflict with the Byzantines, and some of the Crusader states also fight against each other, sooner or later. A confused situation, especially within the principalities. In this time, at this time, the Crusaders had new problems to deal with in their territories. They had created a new society, of course, consisting of Muslims, Jews, and new Christians from the Latin world, but also including, for example, members of other Christian faiths of the East, such as Nestorians, Monophysites, and others. You had, if you like, to gather together all these different religions and cultures under one roof. I suppose you could even call it the foundation of something like a multicultural society. An optimistic description, but not necessarily wrong. As an occupying power, the Crusaders, like the Muslims, were quite bearable. Business as usual is perhaps an accurate description of the mood in the Crusader states. The Arabs have to pay taxes, but they are not persecuted for their faith. In many areas, especially technology, medicine and crafts, the Muslims are far more advanced than the Crusaders. The Christians learn more from the Muslims than vice versa. And cultural superiority 
also informs the way the Muslims see the Crusaders. Grundsätzlich war der Blick Basically, the Muslims had a feeling of religious superiority. They were of the opinion that the Christian knights had a religion that was simply inferior to Islam. So we find Usama ibn Munkid beginning his chapter on Frankish customs by comparing the Franks to animals, in that they possess animal virtues, such as bravery. He respected their bravery, but held them to be culturally inferior because they did not possess the same medical skills or techniques. And finally, very important, they had no sense of honor or shame. Above all, and this was something that really struck the Muslims, the Christian knights were very liberal with their wives. So it was noticed that a Christian knight was standing on the street with his wife, and along came another Frank and spoke to the wife without the husband intervening. The Crusaders' states are dependent on supplies transported by ship. The brisk trade over the Mediterranean is managed principally by the Italian city-states of Genoa and Venice. The Crusades make them fabulously wealthy. The Crusades are the basis for their later ascendancy. The Middle Ages is a period of conflict between church and secular power, a time of violence and strife. The Crusades transfer the disputes of the European empires to a new venue, the Holy Land. Unity among the Christians is weak, their quarrels with each other powerful. After the Second Crusade, Jerusalem, the goal of all the Crusades, will only twice be made accessible to pilgrims, thanks to treaties which Richard the Lionheart and Frederick II negotiate with the Muslims. The coats of arms of the two princes are amazingly similar, although they are not related. Richard's life is an example of the constant quarreling among the Christians. Richard the Lionheart, the legendary English king, lives in France. He has only spent six months of his life in England. His mother Eleanor, later Queen of France and England, takes part in a crusade. His father and siblings become enemies. All his life Richard is entangled in court intrigues, both actively and passively. His probably most important opponent, Philip II of France, is also his ally in the Third Crusade until he quarrels with Richard and returns home to wage war on England. But first they advance together into the Holy Land and fight for their common cause. They conquer Jaffa and Cyprus, the most important base of retreat for all later Crusaders. Richard never reaches Jerusalem. He is weakened by domestic intrigue. But he negotiates with Saladin, the legendary commander and victor of Hattin. The result is a treaty which gives him Tyre and Jaffa, and pilgrims access to Jerusalem. On his return journey, Richard falls victim to a plot. He is made prisoner and taken to Germany to Henry VI. But Henry allies himself to Richard and frees him in exchange for a ransom. 
change of scene. Frederick II, known as the wonder of the world, is raised at the court of the Norman king Roger on Sicily. Sicily was once occupied by Muslims. The young Frederick comes into contact with a superior Islamic culture, a formative experience. The Castel del Monte, a symbol of Frederick's thirst for knowledge. From here, he corresponds with Islamic scholars. For many of his contemporaries, Frederick's admiration goes too far. His castel is octagonal, like the imperial crown, or like the Muslim Dome of the Rock. From the Arabs, he learns falconry and writes a scholarly treatise about the birds, which is unrivaled for centuries. Under his rule, Muslims live in peace on Sicily. They have their own part of town. Even his bodyguards are Islamic, very clever. Their lives depend on him. Frederick has taken a vow to lead a crusade, but he doesn't go. The Pope excommunicates him. In 1228, the crusade takes place, despite the excommunication. There are battles. But above all, there are negotiations and a treaty with the Sultan al-Malik. Frederick II's treaty is more remarkable than Richard the Lionheart. Firstly, because it's valid for the next 10 years, and especially, of course, because the treaty is agreed without any accompanying military action. So Frederick II was hardly a, a military commander in the Holy Land, but rather, and primarily, a negotiator. After his death, it is even rumored that Frederick was, in secret, a Muslim. That is nonsense. But he admires Arab culture and orders himself buried in an oriental robe. It is indisputable that the Arabs of that time were more advanced in all matters of science than their European contemporaries. But how do the Muslim peoples react to the Crusaders who invade their land? The foreign knights arrive mainly by sea. The Christian soldiers have a reputation for bravery. They are specialists in siege technology. But militarily, this is nothing new for the Arabs, who favor sudden attacks, raids. Like pirates, a constant plague at the time, the Crusaders are just one more enemy among many. And, like pirates, they only appear along the coast. The difference is that after attacking, the Crusaders do not disappear again, but remain as invaders. Even so, they are not perceived as a threat to Islam. The standards of hygiene and medical care among the Crusaders both amazes and horrifies the Muslims. Whether Crusader or Arab, short-term power strategies provide fertile ground for intrigue and shifting alliances which often transcend religious boundaries. Not so much a clash of civilizations as a skirmish of warlords. For the Arabs, the foreign soldiers come from a mysterious, dark and cold land where terrible monsters dwell. The more distant the Crusader's homeland, the more terrible the monsters. Muslims call all knights Franks, no matter where they actually come from. And yet there is an astonishing cultural bridge, the ideal of knighthood, courage and honor. Even the European tradition of troubadours singing of courtly love is probably a borrowing from Arab culture. The chivalric ideal is certainly something which linked the two cultures. In Europe as well, at this time, there was the notion of an ideal of knighthood, which was interreligious, above religion. 
Consider, for instance, the epic poems of Wolfram von Eschenbach, Parsifal and Wilhelm, which basically developed the ideal of knighthood as a link between religious faiths. In Bruderschaften eintreten, die über die Religionen hinaus Brotherhood which goes beyond religion, so that a knight could have a Muslim brother, a heathen brother, all sharing the same ideal of courage. That's the idea of the knights on their quest for the Holy Grail. Das ist der Gedanke des Graalsrittertums letztlich. The community of noble knights and their quest for truth as a bridge between mortal enemies, religious warriors. In Europe, Saladin is still admired for his chivalry, and the history of Muslims and Christians still hides many common features waiting to be discovered. In the name of God, the great world religions preach peace and mercy. History, even modern history, shows that religion and violence are not contradictions. In the 16th century, there emerges a new Christian denomination. Latin Christianity, already separated from the Orthodox Church of the East, splits once more into Catholics and Protestants. And in the name of Christ, they go to war against each other in the bloodiest conflict that Europe has ever known. A new age has dawned in Europe, a new image of the world, the Renaissance. Everything is in a state of flux. Astronomy and other natural sciences, art and architecture. The way in which people see each other and their world is radically transformed. The perspective becomes naturalistic, realistic. Courageous seafarers, especially the Portuguese, venture out into strange, unknown worlds. With new instruments of navigation, new maps, in 1522 Magellan's ships proved that the world is round. A time of upheavals in matters of belief too. The Bible, whose Latin was inaccessible to the common people, becomes the book of books, and a dissatisfied German monk unintentionally changes the world. Martin Luther does not want a reformation, he only wishes to reform. But that is not how it turns out. It is as though his time is ripe for more. A new invention, the printing press, a technical revolution which makes possible a spiritual one. Was Gutenberg mit der Buchkunst, Buchdruckerkunst macht, der Gutenberg's printing press, printing with movable type, encourages mobility and improves communication to an extent that was previously not just unknown, but unimaginable. The moral authority of the church, of the popes, has reached its nadir in the company of the Borgias. The children of Pope Alexander VI, Lucretia and Cesare, rule like their father through intrigue, murder and violence. When this Pope dies, open jubilation breaks out in the streets of Rome. The Augustinian friar, Martin Luther, despairs at the intolerable situation, the corruption of the church. He is not a revolutionary, only a medieval monk, but a stubborn one who wrestles with theological problems. 
In all probability, he never nailed up his 95 theses composed in Latin to the church door in Wittenberg, however popular the image. After all, who would have been able to read them? What is true is that he sent them in the form of a letter to the Archbishop of Mainz. Seine handschriftlich niedergelegten Thesen gelangen in einer handschriftlichen His handwritten theses reached Nuremberg in manuscript form. There they are translated from the original Latin. Sie werden dort übersetzt und am Ende des Jahres 1517. Then at the end of 1517 they are printed and copies are distributed in vast numbers throughout the empire. Auflage vervielfältigt im Reich verteilt. Luther had nothing to do with this and it certainly wasn't what he intended. Drauf gehabt, und das ist auch nicht in seinem Sinne gewesen. The result is uproar. Luther is excommunicated. In 1521, after a staged kidnapping, the Prince Elector Frederick III of Saxony hides Luther in Wartburg Castle, where he translates the New Testament into German. His forceful style has a profound influence on the German language. One year later, his text is printed with far reaching consequences. Luther ist nicht der erste, Luther isn't the first to translate the Bible into German. In the 15th century, we already have translations. I can't just recall how many into other national languages, including German. But Luther's translation, his translation of the Bible into German, is the one that really takes off, really catches fire. A fire that Luther has not intended. His religious texts are understood as an inspiration to revolution. Thomas Munzer debates with Luther and summons up forces that he can no longer control. I do not come bringing peace, but the sword. He who lives by Matthew the sword 10. shall die by the sword. Matthew 26. Initially sympathetic towards the insurgents, Luther then calls on the ruling princes to adopt stern measures in his tract against the thieving and murderous hordes of peasants. He does not wish to be associated with the brutalities of the peasants. And unlike Münzer, he does not want a revolution. Bauernkrieg, das ist ja ein the peasants' war is just a name. And it gives the wrong impression. There wasn't a war as we understand the term, rather an unknown number of isolated uprisings. These peasants' revolts constitute a tradition going back into the 14th and 15th centuries. But what the princes actually do is also not what Luther intended. Luther suffers under the Reformation as much as he influences it. He has no control over events. The Reformation attracts fanatics. Revolt against the clergy spreads like wildfire. Iconoclasts attack churches. In Munster, for a few bizarre months, Anabaptists rule a totalitarian state. They demand common ownership of property and prohibit marriage. When the riots are suppressed, the corpses of the ringleaders are displayed in cages. The Reformation spreads throughout Europe dividing into ever new factions. Zwingli in Zurich, Calvin in Geneva. Even Scotland has its own local hero in the form of John Knox. And in London, Henry VIII seizes the opportunity and founds the Anglican Church, principally in order to secure himself a divorce Reformation also means a reallocation of power. 1546, the Catholic Emperor is at war with Protestant princes, the first interdenominational war. After the Emperor's victory, a process begins which finally leads to a peacemaker's compromise. Subject citizens must adopt the faith of their ruler. The Augsburg Religionsfrieden schafft insofern etwas Neues. The religious peace of Augsburg does result in something new, in that it strengthens something that already exists, namely the status of the empire as a whole on a level above the warring parties, a level where the king and the imperial estates 
work together as supreme arbiters or referees, responsible for safeguarding peace and the rule of law within the empire. In der Funktion eines Schiedsrichters dann dafür verantwortlich, den Frieden und das Recht im Reiche zu wahren und zu schützen. Peace among Christians, a frightful error. In 1572 in France, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Actually, a royal marriage between the denominations is intended to bring about peace, but then betrayal. Protestant Huguenots gathered for the wedding are slaughtered in tens of thousands by Catholics, Christians against Christians. The denominations are at war again. It's about religion, but also about power. The new religious faith is an opportune means for ambitious princes to pursue their aims of dominion against the emperor, the kings, and the church. Then, in 1618, the prelude to a European catastrophe. The Prague defenestration, actually the second. Protestants against Catholics, that too. In fact, a long, smoldering power struggle. The revolt of the estates against the emperor is a bohemian tradition. This time, they immediately elect a king of their own liking. The Erfolg des Fenstersturzes wird für uns greifbar. The success of the Prague defenestration can best be understood if we look at the Bohemian Act of Confederation of 1619. Here, we have a document in which the Bohemian estates define what they want in terms that we will later call a state. They don't abolish the monarchy. They need the king to legitimize their own positions. But they reduce his role to such an extent that this Bohemian king, in the concept of a corporate state as defined by the Bohemian nobility, ends up as nothing more than a master of ceremonies. In Bohemia, the Protestant Union musters its troops. Alliances are made. Maximilian of Bavaria calls on the Catholic League to fight. Vienna. Bohemian Protestants refuse to recognize the newly elected emperor. War breaks out. Decades of conflict now explode. Emperor Ferdinand fights for Catholicism. Wallenstein, a brilliant general and entrepreneur. As yet, there is no such thing as a national army. Wallenstein recruits an army of mercenaries and fights on the side of the Catholic League for money. Wallenstein is derjenige, der sich in der Lage sieht. When the emperor asks, "Can you provide me with an army?" Kannst du mir ein Heer zur Verfügung Wallenstein sees himself as ideally suited, as a private individual, a businessman, to offer this service. Als Wirtschaftsunternehmer gleichsam diese Dienstleistung erbringen kann. The first Catholic victories. The Bohemian rival king is defeated. The Protestants lose a series of bloody battles. In Bohemia, Catholic successes are followed by brutal suppression of the new denomination. But now, the Danes fear for the security of their power in Europe. They enter the war against the Catholic Habsburgs. The fortunes of war are fickle, but Wallenstein is almost always victorious. Again, the emperor triumphs over the Protestants. It's fair to say that in the 1620s, the Thirty Years' War is mainly a religious war with powerful political groupings already getting involved. And, at the latest from 1630 onwards, the Thirty Years' War becomes a secular conflict, a European power struggle in which religion still plays a role, albeit no longer a dominant one. A war which perpetuates itself. 
the powers take up their positions. No one dominates for long. A power which achieves a short-term advantage is soon brought down by the others. And everywhere the armies of mercenaries who take what they need from the civilian population. War feeding on war, people say. Soldiers are seen as the brutal scum of the earth who kill for money. For the mercenaries, only money counts. These Söldner übten ein Handwerk. These mercenaries were simply plying their trade. Above all, they made sure they were paid on time. And if they weren't, they changed sides. 1630, Gustavus Adolphus, King of Sweden, enters the war. His power base, the Baltic region, is claimed by the Catholics, a mistake. The Swedish monarch is now the standard bearer for the Protestant cause, and luck is on his side. An irony of fate. Wallenstein has just been dismissed by the emperor, a concession to the Jesuits, the Spaniards, and the estates who hate him. In 1631, Catholic forces besiege and then storm the city of Magdeburg. What happens there is without parallel even for the Thirty Years' War. An orgy of brutality, the city is razed to the ground, the population virtually completely slaughtered. Gustavus Adolphus, the Protestant from the north, is set on revenge. His victorious troops push southwards. Augsburg, a Protestant stronghold, a city where once the peace between the denominations was ratified. There, the soldiers of the Swedish king are now greeted like angels of salvation. A hysterical hope in a land laid waste. But these men too will only bring death, misery and devastation. The Swedish soldiers are also mercenaries. War is their trade. What the Bavarians suffer only a short time later comes close to the accounts of the few survivors of Magdeburg. The mercenaries are all alike. For the first time in the Thirty Years' War, the peasants resist the mercenaries. The soldiers leave behind them a trail of devastation, no matter whether there is fighting or not, no matter what cause they serve. In this hour of peril, the call goes out for Wallenstein. There are many who distrust this vain and unscrupulous general, but he alone is capable of putting a stop to the Swedish advance. Desperate times demand desperate measures. The two commanders clash directly in southern Germany, a battle of the titans, Wallenstein against the army of Gustavus Adolphus. The result, a victory for Sweden, but a victory bought at the price of disaster. In the Battle of Lützen, Gustavus Adolphus is killed. A shock. The messianic leader gone? Rumors spread. He isn't really dead. The Swedes are now losing battles, but they believe they can still secure their influence by negotiation. They are deceived. At this time, nothing is stable. Wallenstein's officers have to swear personal allegiance to him, even if this conflicts with orders from the emperor. So is es auch bei Wallenstein der Fall gewesen, der seine unternehmerische Leistung. In the case of Wallenstein, he was always successful in his business ventures. But when it came down to it, maybe it wasn't the money that mattered after all. But rather, for instance, becoming the Duke of Mecklenburg, a promotion in social rank which put him on a par with the princes of the Holy Roman Empire. Sozialen Aufstieg zu schaffen, der ihn den Reichsfürsten des Heiligen Römischen Reiches gleichstellte. Wallenstein has grown too powerful. What are his real aims? Among other things, he is negotiating with the Swedes for a peace agreement. Does the commander want to become something more than a duke? Not only the Jesuits would like to be rid of him. The emperor orders him captured, dead or alive. 
The Irish captain who stabs him in Eger is only the long arm of the numerous enemies in his own camp. An inglorious end for this notorious commander of armies. The war continues. At the beginning, the Habsburg dynasty had sought war to secure their dominion. By now, they are fighting to retain their existence as a power. Then, in 1635, at the urging of Cardinal Richelieu, France enters the war. Once again, the fighting lays waste to South Germany and Bohemia. Not before 1648 do people finally grow tired of the slaughter. Sweden and France, the remaining great powers, guarantee the end of hostilities. The Peace of Westphalia is signed. The basis for the religious articles of the document is the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. After 30 years of devastating war, a bitter truth. It's back to square one. And yet everything has changed. However, for the ordinary people, the signing of the treaty did not bring about peace. Erst wenn der letzte Söldner ein Land verlassen hat oder auch nur ein Dorf Only when the last mercenary has left the country or even the village does peace return for the common people. in Sachsen And because this doesn't happen in Saxony until 1650, documentary sources there refer to the end of the 32 years war. Uns überlieferten Quellen auch vom nun zu Ende gehenden 32-jährigen Krieg die Rede. Finally, an end to the killing. The cost of the war, the destruction of a continent. The conflict over the right interpretation of Christianity leads to an orgy of cruelty which takes human beings to the brink of the abyss. The accepted worldview is damaged forever. A symbol of this is the gallows tree from which even wounded comrades, now useless as soldiers, are hanged. For the first time, there is something resembling war reportage, ruthless, brutal, realistic. Der Dreißigjährige Krieg hat die Menschen seit der Mitte des 17. Jahrhunderts Since the middle of the 17th century, the Thirty Years' War has never ceased to be of interest because it confronts us with an unimaginable range and intensity of cruelties. What people experienced at the time was handed down to those who came after in writings and illustrations, illustrations which have no inhibitions about depicting cruelty in all its hideous detail. For the civilian population, the presence of the soldiery, no matter under whose flag they are serving, means misery and death. Plundering mercenaries seize what they need, Marauding troops lay waste to the land, even where there is no fighting. There is no mercy, no restraint. Dieser Krieg wird als ein grausames Ereignis. This war is seen as an awful event. Perhaps something like a natural disaster, which devastates a village and against which there is no protection. Auch nicht wehren kann. War feeds on war. The civilian has a greater chance of dying than the mercenary, so men from the starving, pestilential, ravaged villages volunteer for military service in order to live a little longer. Medical care is negligible. The wounded have little chance of survival. But it's still better than starving to death 
or being slaughtered in your own village. A European catastrophe. Most severely affected is the region which will later become Germany. How many deaths has the war cost? All in all, probably 50%. In some areas, population losses could go as high as 70, 80%, judging by the large number of deserted settlements left behind after the Thirty Years' War. In other words, places where people have been living, but which, after the war, are no longer populated, abandoned, deserted. But from the ruins of the wars of religion emerges the idea of the modern nation-state, a mechanism of power, a neutral structure standing above denominational conflict. Treaties, civil order and the rule of law are to bring about peace, an idea whose consequences extend into our own present day. Hell is humankind itself. The struggle for religious domination leads to the abyss. In the name of the one true faith, man is capable of any imaginable cruelty. So reads the lesson of the Thirty Years' War. By nature, man is and always has been greedy, selfish and cruel. Only an all-powerful constraint compels him to keep the peace. Man is a wolf to man, writes the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes zieht daraus die Konsequenz, dass der Mensch Hobbes concludes that if man is to live in a condition of peaceful coexistence, he must be subject to discipline. Zu ordnen ist, die die staatliche He must be constrained in every aspect of his life by a power that can only be the power of the state zu äh, reglementieren äh, sucht und dem friedfertigen Zusammenleben dienen soll. To constrain the greed of man, Hobbes decrees the totalitarian state, an omnipotent monster, Leviathan, which imposes peace and dictates what may be thought, said and believed, an idea which will bear fruit. Absolutism the state ruled over by the French Sun King Louis XIV, one of the practical political consequences of the Thirty Years' War. Rigid, majestic order. The jungle gives way to the garden. The state as a calmly ticking, finely oiled and neutral clockwork. Base instincts and conflicts of belief are held in check by the power on high. The new ideal of the age. In place of the bands of mercenaries hired when needed, we find standing armies, valuable instruments of the state, to be used sparingly. Prussia, under Frederick II, is the ideal model of enlightened absolutism, a sober rational state without an established church. The ganz große Tendenz is the trend is quite clear. Perhaps Frederick the Great put it best. Each man should be blessed as he thinks fit. And so religion is shifted firmly into the private sphere. The practical consequences. In the late 17th century, the Huguenots pour into Prussia, into freedom. Under Frederick II, there's a time when every fourth Berliner is of French origin. A monarchy on the make in which church and state are strictly separated it's a matter of principle. In Prussia, Kant pursues the idea to its logical conclusion. His essay, Towards Eternal Peace, is a blueprint for the United Nations organization. Law should rule over power in a kind of world parliament, an idea which has found little favor with every superpower to date. The separation of church and state is now so taken for granted that the appearance of the Pope before the United Nations is a minor sensation. In the past, popes waged war. Today, the pope has only moral power, not battalions. A long way, which has led from the Crusades of the Middle Ages via the Thirty Years' War to the present day.